All right, so we've had some excellent presentations this morning talking about kind of the future of CXL and um, you know the, the use cases and, and more future looking. So I'm gonna focus a little bit more on more near term and also something very tangible, right? The, the form factors. So my name is Tori Steed. Um, I work at Smart Modular Technologies in product marketing and I'm focusing on CXL products. So I also want to say a special thank you to Frank. Thanks very much for putting this uh, conference together and making it all possible. I know you put a lot of work into it, so appreciate that. Um, okay, let's jump in. So this is a slide you've probably seen a variation of uh, <laughs> already several times today, and probably you'll see it a couple more times, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, you know, CXL is a protocol that operates on the same physical interface as PCIe. Um, Initial devices that we're focusing on are memory expansion. That's kind of where the industry seems to be gravitating um, for the first generation of CXL devices. We do fully expect to see storage and um, networking and, and many other devices gravitate towards CXL in the not too distant future. But initially here, we're talking about memory expansion devices. So I just want to set that expectation. Um, all right, let's talk about the humble DIM for a minute. Um, as uh, IT professionals, or I'm sure everyone is very familiar with the DIM, it's been around since the 90s. Um, prior to that, we had the SIM, which looked very similar to the DIM, at least in terms of a mechanical form factor. Um, it is, obviously there's there's flavors and variations, you know, there's a low profile versions, there's SO DIMs that are more for laptop or uh, type applications, but this form factor has been around uh, for a very long time. And one of the things I want to talk about is scaling memory, right? So when you want to scale memory with DIMMs, obviously you add more DIMMs to the system. Um, and that works pretty well for a while until you start um, getting to larger quantities. And the problem with the, the DIM form factor is that it's a parallel interface, right? So it requires a lot of pins to connect each of these DIMMs to the CPU. So you we're getting very limited on how many DIMMs you can attach to each CPU based purely on that, that pin limitation. So if you want to scale your memory even further today, you have to add additional CPUs, right? And then ev eventually additional servers. And it um, it be can become very prohibitive if all you're really trying to do is add more memory to a system. So memory is changing shape, right? With the introduction of CXL. And we have access now because of the, the new protocol to viewing memory in, in a different way, right? And attaching it in a different way. And that opens up all kinds of options for, for these emerging form factors, which I'll, I'll talk about more in a minute. The other thing that I do want to point out is it's actually very um, beneficial, too, because not only can the CPU talk to memory via the traditional interface, but now you can talk to memory through the CXL interface, PCIe uh, enabled with CXL. And that gives you like a whole other um, access points to memory. And we do expect to see even though CXL, as you've seen in some of the earlier presentations, has some higher latency than direct attached memory, we do expect to see some performance Im improvements as well. And I think there's some other presentations that, that get into that a little bit more. So it's pretty exciting. OK, so the two categories of form factors that I want to talk about are um, the first one is on the left. It's EDSFF. You may be familiar with that form factor already. It's, it's prevalent in, in storage. But um, it stands for the Enterprise and Data Center Standard Form Factor. And there's several different flavors of form factors that are incorporated in that. Um, and, and we'll talk about some of those. The other one is, is I like to refer to as the AIC or the add-in card. I think the official name is CHEM, which is stands for Card Electromechanical. And that one's been around forever, right? You've, you, we've had um, network cards. And the big one I think about a lot is, is graphics cards, right? And now those are becoming accelerators for AI applications, but this is kind of what you think of as a standard PCIe inside the system, you know, large uh, mechanical device, right? So we'll talk about these two categories. Okay, so the first one is EDSFF, and there's two big flavors of, the, of it. One is the E1 form factor, and one is the E3 form factor. The E1 has two varieties. It has a short variety, which we sometimes think of as like a stick of gum. It's a little bit bigger than that, but it's a good kind of point of reference for, for how big that is. And then we have the E1.L. And the E1.L, actually the, the analogy we use for that is the ruler. And that's because it's quite long. It's actually uh, almost triple the length of the E1 form factors. Um, and I wanted to talk about those these a little bit uh, in the next slide, but the next one is 
E3.S and E3.L, right? So the E3 form factors are what you might think of as more traditional, the, the two and a half inch SSD form factor that's been around for a long time, or even the U.2 form factor, right? So that's evolving into more of these E3 standards. And there's two lengths. They're much closer than in, in dimensions than the E1 devices. Um, so there's a, a short and a long shown here. And then there are also um, two, two main thicknesses, right? There's a standard thickness, and then there's what's referred to as a 2T thickness, which gives you about approximately double the thickness, right? And there's some uh, additional parameters that go along with that that we'll talk about in a minute. But the the metric I like to use for, for kind of picturing it in my head is a standard deck of cards, right? So let's talk a little bit more detail. So this is showing the mechanical, the actual mechanical dimensions of the E1 form factors. I do want to put a caveat here that says this is intended as a, a primer, right, for the form factors to give you an idea. If you're actually designing systems that you want to put these devices in, please go look at the actual specs, right, and, and, and you know, measure twice. Um, but this shows the, the relative size of the E1 and the E, E1 and short and long devices. And one thing I want to talk about specifically for CXL is these don't make great options probably for CXL when we're talking about memory expansion. And the main reason is the E1.S is it's just small, right? So in order to fit a CXL controller on here and fit, um, fit enough DRAM ICs to make it kind of practical, is very very challenging. I'm not saying it won't won't happen at some point in the future, but initially it's 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 not looking like a great form factor. The E1.L obviously has a tremendous amount more room. It has more power available. So at first glance, it might seem like that that might be a much better option. The problem is once you place a CXL controller on here somewhere, your DRAM is going to end up being quite far away from the controller. So this one presents challenges in terms of designing just for signal integrity purposes, right? So the E1 form factor, not necessarily great for CXL when it comes to memory expansion. Once we get to storage, uh, then this, this looks a lot more appealing. So then let's talk about the E3 devices. As I said, they're much closer um, in, in size to each other. And this one actually looks like a, a great option for, for CXL. I think we're gonna see some other presentations today and tomorrow. Uh, with some some real devices that are being being presented in this form factor, and there's a lot of advantages um, to this one. There's some some disadvantages too that that we can talk about a little bit. But uh, the main thing is there's two versions: the sh the short and the long. Um, like I said, they're very close to each other. These are, this is relatively to scale here, so you can get an idea of that. And then there's two thicknesses, and they often offer more than just the physical dimensions. There's power considerations that go along with each of these, which we'll talk about um, in a minute. Okay, now let's talk about the, the add-in card form factor, right? So this one has been around forever. If you've ever built a, a system, you're probably very familiar with it from your network card, which is now usually you know built into motherboards. But um, like I said, I think of it as as kind of the graphics cards, which are um, or the accelerator cards. And so there are uh, two kind of main um, form factors. There's one that is a, a standard height and one that's a, a low profile. Um, they also have come in different lengths. And then the other thing I want to point out is they come in different widths as well. So you can have a single width slot device, but you can also have dual width or even triple width. So some of the some of the graphics cards definitely take advantage of that. If we look at the specific um, dimensions, we see that the, the full height is um, shown on the left and height is the dimension that is measured from the gold connectors where it actually plugs into the system up to the top of the PCB. The length is referred to from kind of this L bracket, which is usually where it's um, at the external side of the system all the way across to the other side of the board. And so the one on the left is a full height or sometimes it's referred to as standard height or full height card uh, and it's half length. So the half length card is 167 millimeters. You can also have a uh, full length cards, which are up to 312 millimeters. And those are can be either standard height or low profile. Low profile refers to approximately half height um, vertically. And then there's there can be you can have a half length option as well. 
And then, as I mentioned before, they come in different widths, right? So single slot, dual slot, um, triple slot, or, or triple width dimensions, right? Okay, so let's talk about where these things get installed. So um, there's some pros and cons to talk about for CXL uh, with, with this discussion. So the EDSF F, uh, for, uh, form factor is great because it's commonly designed such that it can be installed in the front of the system and it's easily accessible for service, right? So that's great for storage because we understand at this point how to hot swap um, storage devices. Now the CXL spec does account for hot plug and hot unplug. However, um, so, so that's great. I think eventually putting CXL devices in the front of the box is gonna work really well for being able to hot swap devices. But right now we don't really know how to um, modify the operating system to handle suddenly losing uh, large quantities of memory. So I think that work is being done and it's coming, but for now this, this works well for attaching CXL memory, but that is a consideration. If you pull out a CXL memory device today, your server's gonna crash. Um, so just something to keep in mind more for the short term. Uh, and then the other devices, the add-in cards, they, um, one great thing about the AI boom is we've had a, a kind of a real resurgence in devices supporting the add-in card form factor to support all the graphics cards, right? So they can be installed in uh, several different locations in the system. Sometimes they're installed more towards the, what we would think of as the front of the box, but most servers have at least room for one or two in uh, the rear of the box, often by the power supplies. So, and this is a 1U device, and those um, adding cards are often installed horizontally using a riser card. Um, in larger multi-U um, boxes, they may be vertical as well. But that's just a, a look at where we stand today. Okay, let's talk about capacity considerations based on the form factors. So, this is an E3.S um, device. This is this is roughly to scale, right? So this is a, not to scale on your screen, but to scale relative to each other. So we have a, a CXL controller device and we have the DRAM. There's also a lot of other glue logic that would be required on this device, register chips, PMIX, um, power circuitry, things like that. So you can see that once you add in some of those other um, components, this starts to get fairly crowded. Now you have a top side of a board and the bottom side of a board. So a realistic goal for designing an E3 device is something on the order of 20, or excuse me, 40 DRAM placements, 20 on the top and 20 on the bottom. So if we take a look at what kind of capacity that would give us, um, it, with DDR5, eight of those devices are most likely used for ECC. Um, so you have 32 that are available for data. And if you're looking at a 16 gigabyte, gigabit device, that would give you a capacity on the card of 64 gigabytes, right? We are getting uh, the introduction of higher density DRAM. So today there's 24 gigabit devices available. And if you populated a device like this, that would give you 96 gigabyte device. And if uh, in the near future or already, we have some um, companies coming out with 32 gigabit DRAM, that allows a capacity of 128 gigabytes, right? So that starts to kind of kind of get interesting. I will state that this is this is just looking at um, single die package DRAM devices. There is obviously TSV and 3DS parts as well, which can significantly increase the memory capacity. But you do need to be very careful about um, cost when you're looking at those types of devices. There is a cost premium for them, but you're, it's kind of that trade-off. Do you want, you know, are you are you desperate for more memory and you're willing to pay for it, or are you looking for, you know, efficient um, cost when you're looking at the memory expansion? So it's a trade-off. <clears throat> when we look at the add-in card um, capacity considerations, I'm showing two examples here. The one on the left is an add-in card that supports up to four uh, DRAM modules. The one on the right supports up to eight, right? Uh, they're in slightly different form factors. The one on the left of this is a single width card. The one on the right is a dual width card because of the height of the DIMMs that once you populate them. If we think about what kind of some standard memory configurations are in DDR5 today, a typical module is 64 gigabytes. 
we will see the emergence of 96 and 128 gigabytes as those higher density DRAM ICs become available. You also still have the option of, of 3DS or TSV DRAM with that price premium I mentioned. Um, but I do, so if you po fully populate this forward and add-in card, you can, with one of these options, you can get anywhere up to 512 gigabytes of additional storage um, in the system just by adding one of these add-in cards. Obviously it's doubled for the 8DIM. So if you have room in the system to add a, an 8DIM add-in card, you can add a full terabyte of memory in the not too distant future, right? So it's, it's pretty, pretty compelling uh, memory expansion. Okay, let's just touch on some power considerations a little bit. I talked before about the E1 devices not being well suited from a because of the form factors and because of the routing signal integrity, but it also um, is limiting because of the power, right? E1 and .S in particular, um, the highest power cons uh, option that's available is about 25 watts, which is is really challenging when uh, trying to integrate a CXL controller plus DRAM. But the E3 device is looking a lot more compelling. So if we look at kind of the more common form factors here of the E3.S, the E3.L, and an E3.S that's got a, a double thickness variation, we're looking at somewhere between 25 and 40 watts, right? Those are the kind of the, the power envelope that we have. So if we look at designing a, a device here and you're trying to fit into a 25 to 40 watt power budget, um, the CXL controllers and Blue Logic and LEDs and EEPROMs and everything else on the device is in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 watts. This is a very back of the envelope calculation, you know, um, but this gives us a, a rough idea. So if we think 15 to 20 watts for that, we have kind of the equivalent of two DIMMs worth of logic on, on a device if we design it the way I was showing earlier. Each of those is in the neighborhood of 10 to 12 watts. So our total power consumption of a device like this is in the neighborhood of 35 to 44 watts. It's very rough. There's all kinds of considerations. You know, you definitely have to look at your applications and the specific designs. So take this with a grain of salt. But I just wanted to show that it is challenging to design in this form factor um, with the power budget that we have. But it is possible. And you will see some devices coming out in this, this form factor, right? So <clears throat> we can talk about the power considerations for that in cards. It looks a lot more promising here. Um, as you may know, the add-in cards allow up to 75 watts to be drawn from the edge connector itself. And then in addition to that, um, as you'll see on many graphics cards, you have an auxiliary power connection option as well and can get dramatically more power. But if we focus on the just getting power from the edge connector, we would be looking at 75 watts. So if we do a similar calculation here, if we look at a four dim add-in card, you'll see that our glue logic is roughly the same and controller logic is, is just making an assumption that it's about the same. And if we put four dims on the device, we're looking at somewhere between 55 and 68 watts, which is looking more encouraging, right? So we have a little bit, a little bit more headroom. But the point is both of these are, are doable but there are, we're kind of close to some limits with what the form factors can actually handle when we start looking at CXL. So just something to keep in mind and to set everyone's expectations for what you can expect to see. Um, though there's a lot of uh, creative talent in the industry and I'm sure we'll see these limits being pushed as we go forward. And, and that's it. The, um, the, bar, the <clears throat> uh, code here is a link to the Smart Modular website where we have that white paper that Frank mentioned at the beginning, if you want some more information about the form factors or feel free to reach out to me directly, my contact information is here and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Kind of zipped through that, didn't I, Frank? <laughs> well, we started early, but but that's okay. Sure. Yep. Um, if you have any, if you think of any other questions, if you're going to be on for Tori, uh, you're, you're going to be on for a few minutes, yeah. Tori, then, you know, please use the Q&A and, uh, and Tori will keep, a, keep, keep an eye out. Otherwise, I'm going to share my screen and introduce our next speaker. I believe that uh, Arvin is on board. So Arvin, are you ready to go ahead and get started early? I, I'm ready to start early. Thanks. Okay. So let me give you a proper introduction and... Um, and uh, and we'll get started.
So uh, VMware, uh, the, so, so some of the software that you're going to be using with this new, well, first I'm going to stop recording before I forget.